Thank you very much. So, in the movie Men in Black, Will Smith's character is in shock after his first encounter with an alien. Dumbfounded, he begins to question everything he's ever known. Tommy Lee Jones' character responds to his silence with the following. 1,500 years ago, everybody knew the Earth was the center of the universe. 500 years ago, everybody knew the Earth was flat. And 15 minutes ago, you knew that people were alone on this planet. Imagine what you'll know tomorrow. So, facts change around us all the time. And what we know can have profound consequences. Take radiation, for example. At one time, people thought that radioactive materials had health benefits, and companies incorporated them into products, including everything from ointments and creams to toothpaste, even enema treatments. The idea that radiation could be beneficial was a fairly well-established fact. But of course, we now know it's quite far from a panacea, and in many cases can be quite detrimental to your health, and adhering to the outdated view of the facts can be dangerous. What about nutrition? What foods are healthy or unhealthy for us have also changed over time. So whether tomatoes are poisonous, as was once thought to be true, whether we should eat carbs or fatty foods, what the deal is with red wine, all of this is changing quite a bit. Even how we take care of babies has changed over time. So whether babies should sleep on their stomachs or their backs, whether pregnant women should smoke, I highly doubt that what each of us do with our own children is identical to what our parents did with us. And yet for each generation, we had what we thought were well-established facts. But what about facts that don't impact our lives as directly? So for example, my grandfather in school learned the wrong number of human chromosomes in a single cell, 48 instead of 46. And we all thought that Pluto was a planet. The number of species has increased by thousands in recent years. The number of elements in the periodic table has changed in recent decades. And pity the parent with a child obsessed with dinosaurs. So this is me when I was about three, rocking the young Tom Wolfe look. And, and as a kid, I loved dinosaurs. But what did loving dinosaurs mean to this little boy? It meant loving these, these large, gray-green, slow, plodding, reptilian monsters. We don't think dinosaurs look quite like this anymore. We now think many of them look more like this, these smaller, brightly colored, fast-moving feathered creatures. So in other words, what we think dinosaurs look like has undergone a complete overhaul in only a few decades. In fact, many people still have the outdated view. This is a newspaper article, so the T-Rex image is still not quite correct for a lot of people. So facts are changing around us all the time. And this change can appear random and ever-present. So for many, this can cause a certain amount of anxiety and worry with regards to changing knowledge. For some, it can even cause a crisis of confidence in what we know. And what's compounding this is the seeming randomness with which facts are changing, which, which specific fact is going to be overturned next. So what are we to do? How can we deal with all of this uncertainty? Well, is this really true? Do we need to be relegated to this life of doubt and uncertainty with regards to changing knowledge? It turns out it doesn't have to be this way. Even though facts change, there's an order and a regularity to how they change. And this can give us hope and a way of understanding the world. So going back, back to radioactivity, consider a single atom of a radioactive material, for example, uranium. So when a single atom decays, it breaks down and releases a certain amount of energy. We know how a single atom is going to decay, but we don't know when. When a single atom is going to decay is unpredictable. It could decay in the next fraction of a second, or we might have to wait millions and millions of years. But things change when we go from a single atom to many, many atoms, to an entire chunk of uranium, for example. Suddenly we go from having things being predictable, unpredictable to systematic and regular. We can actually even encapsulate this in a single curve. And this curve can itself be described by a single number, the half-life. The half-life describes the amount of time it takes for half of the atoms in a chunk of uranium to break down and decay. Of course, we don't know which specific atoms are going to be in that half, but we do know overall the shape of the decay in the uranium. And the same thing is true with facts. Even though we can't predict which specific discovery is going to occur or which fact is go going to be overturned, facts are far from random in the aggregate. Instead, there's a regularity and a shape to how knowledge grows, how it changes, and how it becomes overturned over time. And this shape can actually be understood in the language of mathematics. So one of the first people to explore this is a man by the name of Derek J. DeSola Price. So back in the late 1940s, Price had recently become an instructor at Raffles College, what's now the National University of Singapore. And when he got there, the library was under renovation. 
it seems to have been a fairly small operation because the library was actually handing out its books to store to its students and faculty while the library was being renovated. So Price, he, he got a complete set of a British scientific journal, brought it home, and proceeded to stack it in chronologically ordered piles against the walls in his apartment. So one day he was looking at these chronologically ordered piles, and he realized that the heights weren't even, but they also weren't of random heights either. Instead, there was actually a mathematical shape to the heights of the piles of these journals. So he began to collect more and more data, and he realized that it was not simply that the number of pages in a single scientific, scientific journal obeyed mathematics. Rather, there was actually an order to how knowledge grew in general. So for example, he found that the number of scientific journals over overall has grown over time and has obeyed regularities. In this case, uh, also exponential growth, similar to the curve that he found before. From the first journals in 1665 to tens of thousands of journals, only a few hundred years later. The, num the number of elements in the periodic table has also obeyed regularities, and you can fit it, you can fit the curve, you can fit it to a series of mathematical curves. The power of, the, uh, power of particle accelerators over time has also increased in a regular fashion, as each successive technology has increased the amount of energy that we can harness. And even the number of universities over time has obeyed regularities, from the medieval period all the way to the modern day. So overall, how knowledge grows obeys regularities. So to be clear, once again, we can't predict which specific discovery is going to occur necessarily or which paper is going to be published next. But overall, there's a shape to how knowledge grows. And just as there are regularities to how knowledge grows, there are also regularities to how knowledge becomes overturned. One of the easiest ways is to begin thinking about this in terms of the rate at which different types of facts change over time. So imagine you take all the facts and bits of information in your head and you array them on a scale. So on the fast end, on, on the way on the left, you have facts that change very rapidly, facts such about the state of the world, such as what the stock market closed at yesterday or what, what the weather is going to be like tomorrow. We learn these facts uh, daily, but we're also well adapted to recognizing that they change every day. On the other extreme, we have facts that change very slowly or effectively never. So uh, how many continents there are on the earth or how many fingers there are in a human hand. You learn these facts once, you're good. You don't have to worry about them changing. But in between, there's a large amount of knowledge that changes on the order of years or decades. And this actually encompasses a lot of what we know. So for example, how we take care of babies, whether or not Pluto's a planet, facts about the state of the world, such as how many billions of people there are on the planet. So in school, I learned five billion. Uh, we recently hit seven billion. My grandfather, who learned the wrong number of human chromosomes, he learned less than two billion, if not less than one billion. Uh, he, he just turned 95 this last summer. So these facts, and we also have technological facts, uh, facts about technology. So for example, information storage. We went from uh, big floppy disks to smaller floppy disks to CDs to DVDs. Uh, we now live in the cloud. Some of you might remember a period in the early 2000s when we used things called zip disks. So all these technologies are qu changing quite rapidly. So all these facts in this middle area are what I refer to as mesofacts. Facts that change on the meso or middle time scale, on the order of years or decades, effectively on the order of a human lifetime. The thing about meso facts, though, is we often learn them alongside the facts that don't change or change much, much more slowly. But we learn them when we're young and then forget to update these facts. So how do we deal with all of these meso facts, all this changing knowledge? Are there regularities? Well, about 10 years ago, a team of scientists in France set out to measure how knowledge changes in two specific fields within medicine, uh, hepatitis and cirrhosis. These are both related to diseases of the liver. So they gave a series of papers from a span of 50 years to a panel of experts. And they said to these experts, tell us which papers are true and which ones have been overturned or otherwise been rendered obsolete in the intervening time. And they found a clear curve of decay. They found that as the age of a paper increases, so moving to the, to the right, the likelihood that the paper is still true decreases, and in a very clear fashion. In fact, we can even read the half-life off of this graph. It's 45 years. It takes about 45 years for half of the knowledge in these two medical fields to become overturned or otherwise rendered obsolete. And this overall gives rise to the half-life of facts, because it turns out you can do similar or related types of analyses in many different fields, all to understand the rates at which knowledge changes in different fields. So, but just because certain things are being overturned, this doesn't therefore mean that all knowledge is going to be overturned or is going to be otherwise rendered unknowable. This, this flux is simply part of the scientific process. 
and part of an asymptotic approach to the truth. So in other words, as time passes, we're getting closer and closer to a true understanding of how the world really works. So this point was made effectively by Isaac Asimov. So he said, when people thought the Earth was flat, they were wrong. When people thought the Earth was spherical, they were wrong. But if you think that thinking the Earth is spherical is just as wrong as thinking the Earth is flat, then your view is wronger than both of them put together. <laughs> it turns out we can actually measure how our view of the Earth has actually improved over time. So the correct view of the world is a type of geometric object known as an oblate spheroid. But we can look at the amount of error in previous views of the world. So for example, the flat Earth worldview implies zero inches of curvature per mile. It's flat. On the other hand, a perfectly spherical view of the world implies eight inches of curvature per mile. It's a totally different view of the world, but it's actually not that much better, at least for very small scales. Then again, it is a lot closer to the true picture of the world. So over time, our ability to measure and understand our surroundings has improved. And these improvements have often gone hand in hand with improvements in our tools and technologies. So witness the particle accelerator improvements I showed earlier, or Moore's Law in computers. So as our science and technologies have improved, we're better able to measure and understand, our and understand our surroundings. And not only has our ability to measure the world around us improved, but how, but how we define measurement itself, how we define the units of measurement has also improved. So for example, take the meter. When the meter was first defined, it was defined in terms of the distance between the equator and the North Pole. And at the time of the definition, no one had actually even ever been to the North Pole. They redefined it, redefined it yet again, each time becoming more and more precise. We now define the meter in terms, of the, uh, in terms of the speed of light. And with each redefinition, we've understood the world more precisely. So here are successive definitions of the meter, and this is the amount of error in each definition. And you can see the amount of error has decayed, and decayed in a very regular fashion. So as measure, measurement improves, often improving in a very regular fashion, it improves our ability to understand the world around us. But even though we're improving our understanding of the world, we're now also dealing with another problem. As science grows, often growing exponentially rapidly, there's increasingly too much to learn. No single individual can know all of science. You can't even know everything within a single field. And so when this happens, we're left with what I call hidden knowledge. So one of the first people to explore this was a man by the name of Don Swanson. He's an information scientist, and he began exploring this back in the 1980s with a thought experiment. He said, so imagine somewhere in the vast scientific literature, there's a paper that says A implies B. And somewhere else in the vast scientific literature, maybe in the same field, maybe in a totally different field, there's another paper that says B implies C. However, due to the fact that science is so large, there's no single person who's actually read both these papers. And so even though it might very well be true that by combining them, A implies C, uh, but no one actually knows this. And so therefore, knowledge remains hidden or as Swanson termed it, this is undiscovered public knowledge. Now Swanson was not content leaving this as a thought experiment. He decided to actually see if there are such instances in the literature. So he, uh, and he had no specific medical training, but he decided to look within the medical literature. He used then sophisticated uh, computer databases. He used specifically Medline, and he looked for various key terms to see if he could find papers that had never been combined. And he was successful. He found a relationship between fish oil and improving circulatory flow. Specifically, he found that if you take fish oil, it can help improve uh, Raynaud syndrome, which is a certain disorder related to reduced circulatory flow. And then he published this within a medical journal, even though he had no medical expertise. So this speaks to the, the idea that as science grows, it becomes more and more difficult for people to bring ideas from one area to another, because it takes time for that information to diffuse across different areas of knowledge. And we can see this through a cautionary tale, uh, an extreme example. So here is in the diabetes literature. This is a journal, Diabetes Care. It's an article from 1994 uh, by Mary Tai. So the paper sounds rather esoteric. It's a mathematical model for the determination of total area under glucose tolerance and other metabolic curves. Now it sounds like a small result in the metabolic literature, nothing to write home about. But I'd like, I'd like to draw your attention to the top two lines. A mathematical model for the determination of total area. Now, some of you might be aware of certain techniques to determine the area under a curve. Turns out, Tai was not the first. This had been done several hundred years ago uh, by two individuals, Isaac Newton and Gottfried Leibniz. This is, this is calculus. She had rediscovered integral calculus. She'd actually, specifically, the, the methodology was the trapezoidal rule that Newton himself had developed. And somehow, 
this information had not percolated to the diabetes area. At least this woman, Mary Tai, was unaware of it. Now, to be fair, people wrote into this journal after this article came out saying, this is calculus, this is nothing particularly new. Um, but there are this is sort of an extreme example showing that it takes time and effort to actually make sure information spreads, and oftentimes it just doesn't. And so this has even happened in my own research. So back when I was a postdoc, I was working with a colleague of mine, and we had a certain data set, and we wanted to cluster the data in a certain way. Now it turns out there are many, many different methods of clustering data, but we couldn't find what we wanted specifically. So after looking for a while, we decided, okay, we'll just have to create our own. It probably won't, won't be very good, but no one else has done it. Right before we did it, though, I, just, I said, why don't we go talk to the statistician down the hall? He's a smart guy and kind of knows a lot about everything. We went down and spoke to him. Within five minutes, he told us the technique we needed, and about half an hour later, I'd actually programmed my computer with all of this. So there are many, many such instances where information takes time to, uh, to spread from one area to another. So how can we increase this? How can we improve the spread of information? So one of the major ways people are doing this is by developing tools, specifically computational tools. So there are now computer programs that automate what Swanson did back in the 80s. So there are computer programs that scour the medical literature and find relationships between genes and diseases, or diseases and potential pharmaceutical treatments. And so we now know that we can stitch together knowledge using computer programs. This occurs in the patent literature. There are computer programs that will highlight two patents and say, if you combine them, you might be able to create new innovations. Uh, this even occurs in the world of mathematics. There are computer programs, if you give them a set of axioms and a set of previously discovered mathematical theorems, it will generate new mathematical knowledge for you. In fact, there's even a website known as Theory Mine. You can't see the word theory. It's Theory Mine. Uh, that if you go on this website for a small fee, they will generate a novel mathematical theorem that's never been discovered before and then allow you to name it after you or a loved one. <laughs> so this, uh, it's, it's like a vanity license plate for knowledge. So there are now many, many different ways of actually stitching together knowledge. That being said, so we now have ways of actually stitching together knowledge, but there's also the problem of dealing with overturning the knowledge that's in our brains. Oftentimes, just because a scientist learns something new or overturns some older information doesn't therefore mean that everyone is now aware of it. Uh, it takes a long time to actually overturn information. And sometimes people just adhere to outdated things even when they should know better. And this occurs, and there's many, many such examples. So one example is nosebleeds. So how do you treat a nosebleed? Do you lean forward? Do you lean back? Where do you pinch your nose? So it's, I, I was not entirely clear, and this actually came home to me in a very real way when I had a nosebleed one evening, didn't know what to do. I can remember stanching the flow of blood with one hand and searching online with the other. How do I treat a nosebleed? <laughs> Turns out I'm not alone, many other people are not aware entirely. I actually put this question to a, uh, a small, I did a small informal survey online, and I found that in fact only about a third of the people knew the proper way to treat a nosebleed. And according to the, for the record, for, according to the Merck manual, you lean slightly forward and pinch your nose completely closed. So this is, this is wrong, this picture is wrong. <laughs> so why do we have so much outdated knowledge in our heads? Even though I mean, lots of people are learning new things all the time. So I think it comes down to what I call generational knowledge. So when we're young, we're treated as informational generalists. We learn lots and lots about many, many different things. So in grade school, we learn about mathematics, biology, chemistry, English, art, history, all these different things. But as we grow older, we begin to specialize. We learn more and more about less and less. And so if things change in our own field, we can adapt to that because we're learning that. But oftentimes, we don't realize things have changed, even though things are changing smoothly, until that is, our kid comes home and says, guess what? Dinosaurs are warm-blooded and have feathers. It's not until we're confronted by the, by the next generation. So even though knowledge is changing smoothly, we perceive it in a fairly stepwise fashion. So this uh, became clear to me uh, when I was reading an essay about Legos by Michael Chabon that he published several years ago. So he was talking about the, uh, uh, the current state of Lego. He was bemoaning it. He was saying back in his day, Lego pieces, there are only a few basic types, there are a few basic colors, but now it's way out of control. We have all these specialized pieces, we have all these themed sets, we have Harry Potter Lego, we have Star Wars Lego, we have, I guess this is alien abduction Lego, I'm not really sure what this is. So all these things are out of control. So as I'm reading this essay, I am nodding in agreement, I think that, yeah, Lego has kind of gotten out of control. Until that is, Michael Chabon discusses the reason he thinks 
that Lego has had this downfall, this bastardization of all Lego. He points to the Lego minifigure, these little yellow guys. He says, with the introduction of the Lego minifigure, that was the downfall of Lego. And that was when I thought he was wrong. I mean, this is not possible. The Lego minifigure is part of classic Lego. This is what I grew up with. And then I realized that's exactly what had happened. Whatever environment Michael Chabon or me grew up in, we thought that was what traditional Lego should be. We thought that is the way it should be. And we had trouble adapting to changes after us. This is actually known in ecology as shifting baseline syndrome. So whatever environment you're born into, you take to be your baseline. And so even if a body of water's fishes has been depleted quite a bit, if it happened before your lifetime, you don't realize that all this change has happened. And so you take whatever you're born into as the baseline. And this is actually a very big ecological problem. And so you can see how we adapt to, how we adapt to changes in knowledge um, through thinking about language. So there are many linguistic facts. We have how we define words, how we pronounce words, what are considered accepted dialects, all these different things. The linguistic facts are interesting because they're sort of this population average of all the different things that are in everyone's heads. So linguistic facts can change, but they change fairly slowly. So here's an example. So how many of you would be willing to say that something or some activity is very fun? Right. Some, a small amount. Um, many of you would not be. I thought it was OK. I was having a conversation with my grandfather, and I mentioned that something was very fun. He said, this is not OK. This is not proper English. It's unacceptable. And my brother and I both disagreed with him. And here is the reason why there was a di discrepancy. If you type the phrase very fun into Google Books engrams, where you can see the frequency of words and phrases over time, you can see that for nearly 200 years, very fun had a very low frequency. Until, that is, the early 1980s, when it skyrocketed, which is right around the time I learned how to speak English. Now, I'm not saying that I caused the change, <laughs> but, but I grew up in an environment where very fun was considered acceptable. And so my grandfather, who grew up in an earlier, an two generations earlier, he had difficulty recognizing that the language had evolved and changed around him. So overall, lots of facts are changing. And we're not always well equipped to deal with this. Ultimately, we need ways to be prepared for changing knowledge around us, no matter how it occurs. So happily, knowledge change uh, is far from random and capricious, as I hope I've shown so far. Uh, by understanding the regularities and how this happens, you don't have to be worried or anxious, though, by the changing knowledge. In this, instead, by understanding this, this can allow you to place bounds on your surprise. So medical schools already teach this kind of thing. They teach their students that a large fraction of what they learn is going to become obsolete within a few years of their graduation. So if we can be made aware of the regularities behind changing knowledge, whether in medical school or otherwise, the changes around us won't be as alarming. So where do we go from here? How will knowledge change in the future? So now I'd like to be a little bit more speculative. So many people, when they hear about the title of the book, The Half-Life of Facts, they say, so is the half-life speeding up? Is it slowing down? What's happening for the future of scientific knowledge? And the truth is, you can probably make a compelling argument for both directions. You can say, OK, on the one hand, maybe things are speeding up. We have a lot of scientists around. We're learning many, many new things. Obsolescence is happening more and, uh, more, and more rapidly. There's this exponential growth of the scientific literature. On the other hand, though, so for example, if you take medicine, medicine progressed from being an art to a science. When it was more an art, there was a lot of stuff that was wrong and needed to be rooted out. And so there was maybe a lot of churn then. But as we learn more, things are slowing down. In fact, many people think we have a pretty good handle on how the world works. But if we think that way, though, we still have to be aware of what philosophers of science call the pessimistic meta-induction. Yes, it's true that we understand the world around us really, really well. But guess what? Every generation before us also thought the same thing. So we have to be a little bit pessimistic, a little maybe cautiously optimistic about this. But maybe also, in addition to knowledge slowing down or speeding up, maybe there are actually fundamental limits to what we can understand. So the first hints of this were related to something known as the four-color problem, or four-color conjecture in mathematics. So the, the problem is, given a map of abstract shapes, or the way to think about it is in terms of a country, or in terms of countries, so a map of countries, the question is, how many colors do you need to color the map such that no two shapes or countries that are touching have the same color? And for a long time, people thought you only needed four colors. But no one had been able to prove this. And then some mathematicians came along in the 1970s and finally proved it. 
But the mathematical proof had a little bit different shape than other mathematical proofs. Most proofs are maybe like 10 or 30 pages long. You read through them, you understand what's going on. But here is what the four color theorems proof looked like. So this is from the authors themselves describing it. This leaves the reader to face 50 pages containing text and diagrams, 85 pages filled with almost 2,500 additional diagrams, and 400 microfiche pages that contain further diagrams and thousands of individual verifications of claims made in the 24 lemmas in the main sections of text. In addition, the reader is told that certain facts have been verified with the use of about 1,200 hours of computer time and would be extremely time consuming to verify by hand. The papers are somewhat intimidating due to their style and length, and few mathematicians have read them in any detail. So people think this proof is correct, and actually since then people have made simpler proofs. But even though you could say, okay, for when the computers were doing its thing, we know from one step to the next, we can understand like, the logical leap that was made by the computer. But no person can actually go through the 1,200 hours of computer time. It just wasn't possible. And so it seemed as if maybe this kind of proof was just not understandable due to humans. And so I mentioned before with hidden knowledge, computers helping out and allowing you to stitch together knowledge. But when the computers helped with this, with uncovering hidden knowledge, oftentimes it might find two papers that need, that need to be connected, but no person could find them just because it's so time consuming. But once you find the papers, you can still understand how to connect them. In this case though, this seems to be the harbinger that maybe there are certain cases where we actually can't understand the discoveries of computers. So more recently, there was a computer program known as Eureka that was developed by some scientists at Cornell, where uh, it uses what are known as evolutionary algorithms. So you give it a whole bunch of data from certain experiments, and it evolves equations to find patterns in the data and actually explain the data. And so if you do this, uh, it actually is very, very powerful. Uh, when people have put in certain data sets, uh, it will actually recapitulate certain fundamental ideas from physics, such as the law of conservation of energy. But in other cases, scientists have put in a whole bunch of data and it's found patterns in the data. But in, th in those cases, it's actually created equations that the scientists themselves don't know what they mean. So for some people, this can actually be a little bit worrying. So the mathematician Steve Sturgatz, who is also my graduate school advisor, he says that this might be what he calls the end of insight. So we had a several hundred year run from like the beginning of the scientific revolution to maybe some time in the near future where we understood scientific discovery but maybe this period is coming to a close. So he was a little worried, but I'm not really sure this is a problem. So back in the day, science was simple. So uh, we had like four elements. I and mean, science was wrong, but science was simple. <laughs> but then we began to test nature and examine it more and more. And as we did this, science began to become more and more cognitively demanding. There was more and more we needed to know. So a scientist now needs to learn a whole bunch of stuff in order to make a, uh, make a contribution at the frontier. And so you need to know everything that came before you. And so as science grows, this becomes harder and harder. And so there are actually hints of this in the now discredited idea from biology known as ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. So what this means is that the embryonic development of an organism mirrors its evolutionary history. So the reason so we have gills as embryos because we were once fish. Now, this is wrong. It's actually, it's not a good idea in biology. But some people have said maybe it works in the realm of knowledge. And maybe there's some sort of informational ontogeny uh, recapitulating phylogeny. Now again, this also does not work. To be a world-class chemist, you do not need to know alchemy. Nonetheless though, there are certain cases where we can see hints of this. So for example, in mathematics, if you look at the ages in which you learn certain mathematical ideas in the British educational system, this clearly parallels the order in which these ideas were discovered throughout human history. And so what this ultimately means is that, at least in some sense, knowledge is cumulative. In order to make a discovery at the frontier, you need to know a lot. And so as science progresses, more and more is actually known to fewer and fewer. So maybe back in the day, 100,000 people understood certain ideas in physics. Maybe now, only a hundred or a couple hundred people understand certain esoteric areas of quantum mechanics. Maybe there's 10 people who understand something even more esoteric. Uh, and if you write a dissertation, chances are you're the only one who understands what you wrote. So, but, so is there a difference though of going from like 100,000 to 100 to 10 to five to one to no one? Is that really a difference in kind or simply a difference in degree? Now, I'm not really convinced it's actually a qualitative difference, but even if it is a qualitative difference, 
I'd like to argue that we can have a more positive perspective. We can have one of nachas. So this is a Yiddish term. It means emotional gratification or pride, especially taken vicariously at the achievement of, uh, achievement of one's children. So you have nachas, or you shep nachas, that's the term, uh, when your kid graduates college, or gets married, or has their bar mitzvah. Uh, these achievements were not your own, but you can still have a certain amount of nachas, a certain amount of vicarious pride. And the same thing, I argue, can be true of our machines. These are not our discoveries, but they're our machines, and so therefore we can have a certain amount of nachas. And so I'd like to think that itself can be a little bit exciting. Not everyone agrees with this, but I think it's a positive perspective. Ultimately, however we learn th new things, we shouldn't be overwhelmed by all of the change around us. So we know a lot about the world. We're approaching a true understanding of the universe. But along the way, so much of what we know is going to change and become overturned. But far from being overwhelming, this is actually terribly exciting. This is why scientists, and increasingly computers, work at the frontier. It's where we know the least, but where the most exhilarating things are happening. So whether a scientist or not, we need to internalize this idea of changing knowledge. If we can incorporate this into how we read the news, think about public policy, even how we deal with differences between our children's textbooks and our own, we won't have to be as surprised by the change around us. And it can, it can even provide us with a sense of humility and even nachas. So don't turn away from changing facts. Embrace them, armed with the understanding that they obey certain rules. As Tommy Lee Jones said, Imagine what you'll know tomorrow. Thank you very much. All right, we have time for questions. Uh, before the book signing, raise your hand. I'll come by with a microphone. It's been said that uh, the various groups in Washington knew about the Boston bombers, but they didn't share the information. Would it be difficult to set up a program where everybody could know what's going on? <laughs> so this is certainly a problem. And the larger an institution or a bureaucracy is, the harder it is for information to be shared. Over the past 10, 15 years, many, many people have tried to develop such techniques and su such programs and, and uh, systems to actually allow this to happen. It's still a very, very hard issue. And right now, I mean, one of the major issues is if you're not looking for the same, for the right key terms, you're going to miss it. So like, for example, within science, I mean, off, there's actually many, many instances where ideas have been reinvented time and time again. There's actually a paper that I found where they discuss one idea, some mathematical model in, in probability. I think it's been ind independently invented like eight or 10 times. And, and the reason is, is because People use different jargon, diff different terminology. And so I think that's a bigger problem. So right now, I mean, as natural language processing programs, I and mean, Google is doing a great job with this kind of thing, as they get better and learn synonyms and learn the nuances of meaning, I think we're going to get there. We're certainly not there yet. Uh, there are many people working on these kinds of things, but we have, we have a long way to go. Um, in, in all the mathematics that you did in your the charts, I didn't see any mention of the change in population over the past, I mean, what, a little over a century ago, there was maybe a billion people in the world, and that's doubled and doubled and doubled again. Wouldn't that have an impact on, well, the slope of your half-life or anything like that? That's a very good point. Uh, there's actually, there's a whole cottage industry of people who have actually looked at the relationship between population and innovation, so technological growth, scientific growth, all these different things. And there is a very, very clear relationship. Um, they found that when, um, as the population grows, you actually, and you have the ability to specialize and then also create new ideas. Uh, there's actually a great paper that has looked at um, different geographical areas, so uh, totally self-contained geographical areas, and based on their size as a proxy for how how uh, large a population they can hold, um, they've actually found that they're more advanced. So for example, uh, prior to um, Europe going to the Americas, uh, sort of Eur Eurasia plus Africa was sort of one self-contained thing. There were a lot of people there, and so the argument was therefore they could have more developed uh, technology. On the other hand, the Americas still did have very, very advanced technology as well in terms of cities and sophisticated calendars, but it wasn't quite as much as Eurasia. 
On the other hand, though, that was still more advanced than Australia, which could sustain a smaller population, which in turn was more, they had more technologies than Tasmania, which is smaller. And then there was even a tiny little island that I think it was called Flinders Island, I believe, that it was so small, it couldn't even sustain its own population, and they had a few basic technologies, and they actually, they, the population died out. And so there definitely is, and there's a lot of arguments that there is a clear correlation, not necessarily a totally proportional correlation between population and innovation, um, but there is that, that's definitely a clear one. Actually, people have found that oftentimes the larger a population, the more interconnections between individuals. And so there's actually a greater than linear uh, relationship between innovation and population. So the more people you have, if you double the population, you don't get double the innovation, you actually get more than double, because it's not just the number of people, it's actually the connections between them. That's a great question. I stand back here in okay. the back of the room. All righty. Um, I have a couple questions. Uh, the first question is, uh, you mentioned briefly how knowledge grows and obeys um, certain regularities, um, especially when, when plotting these relationships over time. Um, I was at, the first question was, can you go in detail maybe a little bit about those regularities and which specific knowledge um, follows? And then the second question was, um, as, as the knowledge grows over time, how have you accumulated um, all this statistical, I guess, data from these different areas of study to plot this data? Because it seems too vast to have to plot these linear and exponential relationships among the knowledge growing. That's it. Oh, that's good. So I, I, I'm not entirely, so the first question, were you wondering like what specific curves for different fields? Is that what you're interested yeah, in? Okay. Much. So um, yeah, and so most things actually do grow exponential. This is just this massive doubling and rapid growth. And so there's different rates. So, the, so you can have a different exponential rate depending on the field. Uh, so actually in the book I show, um, it depends how you measure it. There, but you can actually measure the, um, the half-life or like the rate of like the rate of doubling in different fields of science as well as technology, and they all have different different rates of, of doubling. Um, they're generally exponential. There are certain cases where the, um, science also adheres to a logistic curve. So this is where things initially grow exponentially rapidly and they eventually slow down. Uh, oftentimes, though, science proceeds according to a set of logistic curves. So even though it seems like things are going to slow down, they then speed up again. And so I think the uh, periodic table, the number of elements in the periodic table our discoveries of those have actually proceeded according to a series of logistic curves because there'll be a new technology to discover new elements and then a whole bunch of elements will be discovered and then things will slow down and then someone else will discover a new tech, another technology and then we'll get more. And so, that, so it's often proceeded according to a series of curves as well. Uh, to your other question, in terms of how people get the data, so back in the day like when I met with like Derek Price, uh, I think it was a whole bunch of grad students and undergrads coming through the literature. It was manpower and he had a lot. Uh, nowadays, though, a lot of this is becoming digitized, and so it's actually really easy. Uh, it's not necessarily easy to get good, clean data, but we now have a lot of data about the number of papers. We know all about the keywords in different fields. We can actually create um, and examine networks of collaboration by actually looking at the authors from one paper to another. So we can see how people uh, are connected from one field to another based on collaboration. We can also see uh, how papers cite each other. So if one paper references another one, that's a really good measure that, that, that the paper that's being cited is somehow influential. And so we have good metrics for that. There's a whole cottage industry, a whole field of, in this case, it's called scientometrics, which is the science of science, how to actually measure science. And there's a lot of different techniques of, to really understand this. But yeah, now through digitization, um, it's unbelievable what we, what we can do. But back in the day, I mean, yeah, Price was working really hard. And I don't know where he got some of this data because it was really hard to come by, but I think it was just a lot of grad students coming through the literature. Over on your left. On your left, yes. Uh, I wasn't gonna ask anything until I heard the first question of the night. Uh, I have some experience in uh, stealth technology. I used to fly the stealth fighter in the old days. And I wondered if your work has uh, taken into account the knowledge that we don't know, excuse me, the knowledge that we know, but we won't share. That's very interesting. Uh, so a lot of these studies do not take that into account. It's all based on publicly available data. Um, but there are many people who think about this. So there's actually, in, uh, in computer science, there is a open problem known as P versus NP. So it's whether or not two different types of uh, computational problems are equivalent to each other. 
And if we know the answer, and if it comes out a certain way, it actually has really big implications for cryptography, for making and breaking codes. And so there are a lot of people who think that the NSA, the National Security Agency, knows the answer and is just not telling people and reading everything that's been, that's been encoded and encrypted. Uh, I'm not really sure I buy that. Uh, but I, yeah, it definitely is an interesting problem that we don't, um, we don't really know. What, yeah, and it's, it's another problem, the hidden knowledge problem. Uh, the easiest way to see this in still the open is in certain situations, like so geopolitical situations. So for example, the Cold War. So scientists weren't able to share as much information then, or, or just times of actual outright war. So I believe, um, so Richard Feynman, the physicist, he shared the Nobel Prize with a Japanese scientist. They both did their research independently because it was wartime. And so they weren't able to share it. So that's a little bit different than people actively trying to hide the information. I don't think anyone's done anything good about that. But that's, really, that's a really interesting question. You not only have a short half-life for facts, but you also have an exponentiating speed of the communication of alleged facts and real facts. And you also have an increased um, number of the access to facts uh, using all these technological gadgets that we have. So when you look at, uh, for instance, Arab Spring uh, and the impact of communication of certain facts, et cetera, or certain observations, that uh, changed history. I wonder about the half-life of dictatorships. Hmm. As you have a shifting, uh, uh, how did you call it, a shifting baseline syndrome that helps sustain dictatorships. But with the access to uh, facts through Google and Wi-Fi and all that sort of thing that, that, that can be known across national boundaries, across language boundaries, uh, how that affects the half-life of, the, um, of this baseline syndrome. Hmm. Well, I mean, the internet and rapidly expanding knowledge is definitely an equalizer in terms of it, it makes it hard for dictatorships to maintain their edge, and that's the reason North Korea doesn't allow any of this kind of thing in order to maintain their hold. Um, although paradoxically, if I remember correctly, I think when, when, when there were all these protests in Egypt, when Egypt shut down their internet, this actually made things worse because it was also just a very heavy-handed action. Uh, I think overall, the rapid spread of information can work wonders. Uh, and it also depends like how people are doing it and how it's done. Um, in addition, the other thing, in terms of science, and Information can wing its way around the world incredibly rapidly. Uh, it still doesn't always get to the people who need it instantly. I, I mentioned my example with um, when I was a postdoc, where and the information had been around since the 60s. We didn't know about it because it was slightly different terms, or just and even though it was readily available on the internet, and I, that was where I found it. Uh, but in terms of political implications, uh, I haven't thought about that too much. But yeah, my sense is it changes things very, very rapidly. And it can be a little overwhelming, but in a good way. Yes, I would like to have a little clarification on the uh, computers uh, producing equations now, which mathematicians do not understand. And I don't know if you did, but I almost got the inference that they will never understand these equations. So I'm not sure we're at the point where we'll never understand them. I think these are, the things I was showing were sort of hints of maybe something to come. Uh, so for example, with the four color theorem, that proof, uh, people have made simpler proofs, but also I think people, a lot of mathematicians actually have a pretty good sense of how that proof worked. They might not necessarily know the details. Uh, in terms of other examples, people don't necessarily understand those particularly well. There's, and there's numerous examples. This then actually moves more into philosophy of science of like, what does it mean to actually explain explain an idea or also understand an idea? And how do you decide whether or not something has been discovered? And how do you, like, who do you trust? Is it the, the scientific community and mathematical community? Is it a computer that we assume is entirely correct? Uh, these are a lot of questions that they're deep, they're profound. A lot of mathematicians are not thinking about them uh, because that's not their area, they just want to do math. Uh, there's a lot of mathematicians who actually think that using computers to do mathematics is not real math. Like if you're not using pencil and paper and you can't understand it fairly easily, that's not math. That's just kind of like goofing around on a machine. And 
and I think, but I think the younger generation is recognizing these are actually very powerful t t tools, and we can actually create discovery in partnership with them. Uh, but uh, I don't think we're, we're still at the point where we understand most of the things. Uh, but yeah, I, but by and large, I think there, there will come a time, uh, and this is, this, is, this is entirely conjecture, I think there will come a time where computers will discover things we actually cannot understand, but we're still in that kind of weird gray space where it's hard to decide what that means exactly at this point. Hi, I was wondering if there's uh, any kind of study of uh, the half-life of misinformation, deliberate uh, things that are put out. So I don't, I have not seen a study in terms of like how long it takes for things to spread or for things to be debunked exactly quite like that in terms of like the type of information. I do know that I believe correct information does travel a little bit faster than incorrect information, if I recall correctly. So this could be another situation where I'm misinforming you and hopefully this doesn't spread too widely. <laughs> but uh, there are people who have looked at this uh, in terms of like, um, not necessarily hoaxes, but like misinformation spreading. Uh, and there are a lot of websites that are designed to debunk these kinds of things. My sense though is that even when information is debunked, the incorrect information stays for a very, very, very long time. And actually I discuss many examples in my book of like things have been corrected and then we change them. I actually just, I, in my book where I'm discussing an example of debunking something, it turns out that story of debunking itself was not correct, but for 30 years spread is a really good example of how information debunked. And I actually didn't, and it was only recently debunked in like the past year or so. So I actually have the incorrect, inform, the incorrect version in my book, though it'll be correct in the paperback edition so you can buy both. But uh, there's, it's a very big question. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting issue. Just, yeah. um, my husband and I are both clergy. And so we deal in facts that are not necessarily facts, but people know them to be true. And it's an area where sometimes the facts are absolutely irrelevant because of peop what people know to be true. And I wonder, are you aware of anybody who's working on the philosophical side of this to deal with um, the life or the half-life of facts which cannot be quantified, but which people know to be absolutely true. Hmm. I'm not familiar with anything related to that. The closest thing I can think of is related to how people choose to have information in their heads um, related to like what, what else they know. And so there's, I mean, there's cognitive bias work and psychology. Uh, I'm not that familiar with that. I, I don't actually know if there's much in the literature. Or at least I'm not familiar with it. So this could be a situation of hidden knowledge. I don't know. Even though I have the office only four doors to the east of you, I know something about your talk that you don't know because we've never talked about it. Okay. Um, there actually aren't just two, there are three co-discoverers of the theory of light and electrons. Not just Tomonaga working in Japan and cut off by the war, yes. um, but Schwinger at Harvard. Mm -hmm. And furthermore, after they presented their three theories, nobody understood that they were the same theory. Um, that is, Tomonaga's was in Japanese, Feynman had invented his own brand new formalism that no one else had ever seen before and understood, and Schwinger's calculations were so complicated and long that almost no one could follow them. It was actually a fourth person, Freeman Dyson, who was the first person to explain that all the other three were the same theory and that they were identical, and how you could actually use them. And alas, Freeman Dyson did not get the Nobel Prize because yep. the Nobel Prize is limited to only three. And it yep. was felt that his work was derivative, even though without him, who knows how long it would have been. Yeah. This, and, and I actually think people who can translate from one field to another, they're just as important. The people who can actually bridge and bridge one field to another. And so, I mean, this is becoming an increasing problem as we specialize, being able to do interdisciplinary thinking. Or in this case, I mean, it's the same discipline. It was just being able to translate from one area to another. This is a very, very big problem. And right now within academia, we don't reward those kinds of things necessarily. And so right now the incentives are misaligned. And so as long as we're not rewarding those kinds of things, people aren't doing them as much, and so a lot of things remain siloed. Yeah, it's a, it's a big problem. I have one more question here. Well, the last question makes me even more want to ask the question I wanted to ask before. 1492, the Chinese, after they depleted all the woods to make a big fleet to figure out what's a knowledge there in the world, decided after they came back, 
it's not worth it, we shut it down. Um, how much of the research you discovered is actually useful? And I don't necessarily uh, expect an answer from you because it's a qualitative answer. But um, do we have a leveling off point where we're going too much into details like we just heard from these four Nobel Prize uh, people? So, well, most of science, I think for a very long time, for pretty much all of science, is at that level of detail. If you actually look at how many, like, how many citations each paper receives, I think a lot of, I mean, a very large number of papers receive no citations. They impact science not at all. And most, and a large number beyond that receive only a very small handful of citations. So most science is in that detail area that's sort of like working out the details, but it's not epic making. It's, it's not gonna change the face of, of knowledge. Uh, it's still very important though, and there are actually people who have examined to what degree science changes based on people making really big leaps versus a whole bunch of people together making small leaps and then add up to something bigger. There's actually, there's controversy about that as well, uh, but I, I still think, I mean, maybe things are leveling off. I still think those small results, they can still add up. Uh, it might not necessarily be as fulfilling and it may be harder to justify each individual result, but as a whole, I think, this constellation of knowledge is moving forward uh, as a whole, even if it's not sorry, a big result. I think it is moving forward. Yeah. Thank you, Sam. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I know there were still a few hands up, but uh, I'm sure Dr. Irisman will answer your question while he signs books over there. Please uh, visit Rainy Day Books and purchase your copy of The Half-Life of Facts. Thank you for attending tonight's lecture. May 9th is our next event here at the library, and then May 10th, Michael Pollan at Unity Temple. Thank you and good night.